Well, good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Good? All right. How many people drink coffee? How many people like good coffee? Well, if you like good coffee, you're going to learn what you can do with that Keurig during this, uh, during this talk, because Keurigs uh, produce mostly garbage, but really cool stuff. So let's, uh, let's give Evan a big round of applause. Thank you. Everybody hear me all right? Sound good? Awesome. I'm Evan, um, as, as the gentleman said. Uh, we're going to start off today uh, with my uh, shotgun of random. I need to put a few rounds through real quick just to get us going. There's a lot of these guys around. These protocols are going to become more popular. Um, uh, uh, companies like this are going to start ad adopting them, and then they're going to get cheaper and cheaper, cheaper and cheaper, and then eventually it's going to be in uh, new construction, and then everyone will have this connected home thing, right? And so um, eventually, uh, uh, audio will be connected, uh, lights in your home will be connected, and then someone's going to find a, a god-awful exploit, and then uh, I really hope that it's one of you and you have a sense of humor, and one of you uh, does this. It's murder night, yeah, woo! And also this, um, <clears throat> all right, cool. So the next time that you tell a joke that's, uh, that everyone in your, in, your, in your crowd should get, and then um, they are a jerk about it and they don't get it, I don't know, say this, say, hey look man, I'm sorry, it, it was an inside joke, this thing we all had to learn in elementary school, like you really just had to be there, I guess, so. All right. <laughs> is, that a, is that a goat? We did my deck. I have a deck goat, officially. This is all random stuff. Cool. Wouldn't it be terrible if you had some condition where like all of your inner dialogue was in garden path sentences? So you'd be like, did I leave the bathroom light on? Toilet paper? Dang it. Frick. Google that later. Okay. Um. Those guys who are jerks are like, it's just like someone walks by quickly and they're like, hey, where's the fire? Like, that is the one time that I really wish that I could produce fire out of my hands. That would be the best time for that. All right. Is Deviant in here? Deviant? Cool. Watch it later. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so Deviant, uh, we were all sitting around at CarolinaCon having a conversation, um, and he got paid a compliment by uh, Chef, and I uh, just wanted to let you know that Chef was absolutely right about that, 100%. And while we're here... Um, Anybody like yard sale in here? Any like yard sailors? Anybody? Someone needs to make an app. Sometimes you find stuff that's still like in the package, you know? Someone needs to find an app that you can just like scan that and uh, it'll tell you where to return it and how much you can get for it, right? <laughs> cool. Oh. All right, we're out. Okay, cool. All right, so this is Jittery MacGyver. That was a shotgun of randoms. All right. Um, we're, today we're going to be talking about finding potential. And I guess another way of looking at this is, um, is MacGyvering, right? So who watched MacGyver growing up in here? Should be a lot of you, right? So if, you, if you're the uninitiated MacGyver, you could, uh, you could put him in any situation, give him any, any stuff, right? And he can like, use that stuff and, and like, find the solution and get, his, you know, get him back into safety, right? So um, really cool guy, a lot of fun to watch. Uh, and I, I'm, I really love that, that kind of problem solving, that kind of engineering. So um, let's look at a couple examples of, of like, solid MacGyvering throughout history, ready? So, um, the first one is George Washington Carver. Uh, this guy is, is a complete and utter badass. So, um, he, uh, he arrived actually at a, at a new job. He's like the director of ag agriculture at, uh, um, at some college in Georgia, right? And uh, they didn't have money to buy his lab equipment, didn't even tell him about it, right? And so, like, instead of, like, you know, rage quitting, he, uh, he took his students and he, like, he, they went and scavenged like, junkyards and stuff and found lab equipment and like, eventually got all the stuff they needed to you know, make cool stuff happen. And you guys probably know um, uh, Mr. Carver for his work on the peanut, right? He made you know, a couple of things with that. So he looked at that and he said, you know, there's, there's some potential here in this little thing. And uh, he did a whole, whole lot with it. Another really cool example is um, uh, uh, Cuba, right? So like in 91, uh, when the... Um, uh, Soviet Union dissolves, they, uh, Cuba found themselves in a, in a really bad financial crisis, right? Uh, they couldn't like trade with anybody, and so they, they sort of had this stuff, and they had to really make do with what they had. 
uh, just to just to get by. So I mean, the, the whole the whole place turned into a bunch of MacGyvers, right? And the government knew that it'd take a long time for them to like work, work their way out of this problem. So they put out these two publications. One was the book for the family, and the other is uh, uh, with our own efforts. And basically, these are like giant compilations of like popular mechanics and like recipes and how-to guides and stuff, just using stuff that they already had, right? So this this book is really interesting. It's uh, it's pretty long. It's like 300 pages long. Uh, I'll highlight some some of the really interesting things for you here. So. Um, uh, first off, is uh, is this cutout of a person with like a, a an uncomfortable amount of attention paid to the nippular region for God knows why? Um, this is uh, it looks like plans for a, a primitive kill yourself device. Uh, and if you liked AK-47, you're going to love AK-47 on a stick for reasons. <laughs> this one's my favorite though. This is the the desplasmatizador. And uh, this you take jars and you connect them with either wires or tubes or something, and maybe some needles. This is, uh, I think that's uh, maybe like, uh, like unsettled uh, uh, Italian dressing or something, I don't know. But anyways, you, you plug all that into what looks like a, either a motor or a, or a uh, compressor from a refrigerator and you plug that immediately into the wall. And I think this probably opens up a, a portal to an alternate dimension where terrible ideas come from. But uh, one thing that everyone had is, is this Arica washer slash dryer combination. And everybody's dryer part of this thing crapped out, right? Something went wrong with it and couldn't use it anymore. So like this, this spawned a whole like underground industry of people who were crafty enough to take these things and like most of the time they would just cut it right in the middle and discard the, uh, the dryer part. But the motors in them were still good. So they used those motors for everything. Like this is shredding coconut. This is a key duplication machine. Uh, this is, I mean, they took a, a outboard motor impeller or, or propeller and uh, slapped it on the motor and made a fan, right? Pretty awesome. And everything was like this. So uh, if you wanted something, you had to build it. And so you had, like, glasses like these, which would, like, earn you plus 10 charisma for even looking at them, I think. <laughs> Holy crap. And, like, these locks are, look, they look pretty secure, right? I don't know. Uh, yeah, maybe those are, they have some in the lock we built. I don't know. Uh, this thing... Uh, Supposedly, this this uh, like refreshed uh, hearing aid batteries. Um, also, if you if you were drinking while you used it, it would remove the need for hearing aids altogether because you would be dead a lot. So uh, this is actually like like a homemade plastic extrusion stuff, right? So like if if OG like Cuban Bane was around, he'd be like, "Oh, you merely adopted 3D printing, right?" And everything's like this. So they use these metal food trays as uh, as antennas. It's amazing stuff. So. Uh, a lot of really, really interesting stuff. There's like there's a whole website. Uh, it's called a Technological Disobedience. Uh, just like dedicated just for this stuff, right? So another uh, really great example. It comes from 1970. In uh, April 11th, we launched Apollo 13. And you guys know that you know we got into space okay. There were a few hiccups here and there, and we were you know trucking along, and all of a sudden. Uh, Houston, we've got a problem, right? So they got, uh, uh, they thought they got hit, hit by an asteroid at first, but it turns out it was just a, a short and some, some Teflon insulation on some wires. It caused a fire. It caused an oxygen tank to explode. And then all of a sudden, like, they don't have any life support. So they had to tunnel over into the lunar module and stay over there because that had a separate life support module. But uh, the problem was that they uh, were clogging the, the lithium hydroxide filters, which scrubbed the, you know, the, the air um, from, you know, for like the, of CO2, and it makes it breathable again, right? So you've got all of the astronauts uh, in this thing, and they need to be in there for four days. That's way too long. So NASA, they, they you know, anticipated this, and uh, they got busy, right? So they're back at home base, and like, well, they've got filters, but, you know, they're, they're square, and they need to fit in a round hole. It's like literally the, the, the peg scenario, right? So they came up with this. This is the mailbox rig. Basically, they just took, like, you know, the, the cardboard cover off the flight plan and a piece of, you know, plastic here and a tube there and all this stuff, and they, they, you know, made it back on Earth, and then they sent them the instructions, and they're asked or not, so they figured it out, you know, and they made one themselves. Look how calm he looks. He's just like, yeah, I just made a mailbox rig. Saved out everybody's life, right? So you guys probably know this story, but my favorite part is this guy, Ed Smiley. He's the, uh, the, was the chief of cruise systems division at the time, and he spearheaded the design and the, the testing of the mailbox rig, and uh, he's amazing. And something that he said later, like after they landed, was this. So when I found out we had duct tape on board, we were pretty well home free. <laughs> Crazy. So, 
Those are a few great examples through history that I love. I um, want to talk about a few things that I've done personally, right? So um, the first thing is everyone's got like a big bin of, of cables in your, in your home, in your office, in your closet, somewhere, right? I, I was no exception. And I, I you know, found that thing and I was like, you know, I, I'm going to do something with this. So I made a universal serial bullwhip. And this is a, a, a eight foot, uh, 18 plant uh, bullwhip. And there's a, a, a very thin leather belt on the end with a, a regular nylon cracker. And um, there's one like thick DVI cable like as the trunk in the middle, you know. And uh, it, you think it cracks? You want to see? Uh, well, I'll tell you what. Hang on. I got it right here. Let's do this thing live, all right? Metal. You'd probably tear your face off. All right. So another one, I was going down to a conference in Atlanta and I, I brought this giant uh, Pelican case just full of office stuff, right? So I immediately got to the hotel room and don't tell them the, I, and uh, took everything apart and from the ashes arose Milton. And Milton, I don't even know what it is exactly, but it's like a, a really heavy spiky bat thing with, with a red swing line on the end uh, for the name. Dude, paper shredder heads are, are like, they're gnarly, man. Good grief. I got so many like little pricks and cuts. And that's RJ45 just kind of wrapping everything, everything together like a boss. So basically just took, uh, like you guys ever run an all-in-one printer? It's like gears and rods and like demons. <laughs> it's like, I don't even know how it works, man. There's like, a spell on all of them. And it took all like the long, you know, sturdy pieces and then I wrapped them all in like some uh, uh, like case metal, right? And I duct taped all that. And this is the size of it. Um, compared to, uh, to two Evans, and um, it's, uh, I guess, uh, around, around 13, 14 pounds, so let's see what it does here. So that was a coconut. Here's slow-mo. The resolution of this video is practically hand-drawn. <laughs> All right, let's see if we can do any more here. Oh! Man, you would not want to get wrecked with that. All right, so uh, that was Milton. The other thing I worked on was terminal cornucopia. And this is something I did uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, the project itself spanned about a year and a half. And uh, basically, I, I, I hypothesized that a, a potential attacker could go into an airport with nothing but cash, right? Maybe like a small travel-approved multi-tool. And um, they could, having successfully gotten through security for you know, no reason not to, just go like, to the shops and you know, get things that anyone could grab and then make potentially de deadly weapons with it, right? So I wanted to, to figure out if that, was, uh, if that was the case, and so I set up some rules. So you could only use materials that can be sourced inside the terminal after security screening. Can't walk in with anything but cash in a small travel-approved multi-tool, and anything you'd get yelled at for taking or messing with is completely off limits, right? And I found some crazy stuff in airports in my day. Like drills and all sorts of stuff. So I went to a bunch of airports, and things that I, I like, couldn't uh, buy commonly, you know, on the store I would get at the airport. Otherwise, I'd just shop at like Walmart or something. It made for some really creepy purchases. But. <laughs> so um, I worked on this for about a year, and sort of like you know scaled up the uh, complexity as I went. And here is a supercut of the uh, the results. You'd use condoms, right? Mm. 
So, completely remote incendiary device there. And then I put it in a suitcase. Long story. Safety first, guys. This went on for like half an hour. Yeah, like everywhere.
That's right. You can make weapons out of the stuff you buy in airports. <laughs> Awesome. That's a lot of fun. All right, so that was actually the really long version of the video I thought that was. So I'm going to go through this quickly. So this is practical post-apocalyptic electronics. Um, I, I was worried that, that uh, more and more people don't really understand anything about electricity whatsoever, but everyone sort of relies on it, right? That's a problem. So I kind of set out to figure out, like, like what's, the, what's the least amount of information someone would need to know to, to like, make practical work happen with electricity, right? If they just have stuff in their house. No tools, really, anything like that. So, so I stayed in a shack in Kentucky. It's like a six and a half foot by 11 foot shack with no power in Kentucky um, for about a week. And um, it'd been about 15 years since I've been in there. It's secure. Totes. And there he is. Okay. That was a giant spider. <clears throat> so the shack is gone. And I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I like lined the walls with, uh, with like tarps. Like I use that foam stuff, like all of it in, in that whole city. Uh, so yeah, I just started building stuff. So I um, used a, you know, one of those tchotchke flashlights, LED flashlights, mounted that to a full bottle, a bottle of water acts as a diffuser, made a nice little centerpiece there, strung up some lights. Um, this is power management. I had several ways to power. I wanted, uh, I wanted to end up with 12 volts and 5 volts, right? 12 volts is, is common with like, you know, vehicles and, and um, automotive, and then uh, five obviously is USB. So you're gonna have a, a billion batteries that, uh, that you know, regulate to five volts, and then um, a lot of stuff that consumes five volts, right? So, um, and there's a strong set. Uh, let's see, so yeah, I put this, this uh, control panel on the wall, and um, this, you know, does uh, different things. I found a, a relay someplace. Uh, let's see, this actually uh, arms my uh, security system in there. So you have to have a key to, to disable it. <laughs> Or just rip it off the wall. I don't. Know. So uh, yeah. So the first thing I wanted to do is like like sort of like start automating things, right? So um, I found this uh, momentary switch and a leaf blower, and I wanted to make it so when I walk in, I have it taped down, that the light would automatically cut on for me. Isn't that nice? I wanted an alarm too, right? Because it's Kentucky and you're, you're just gonna die any minute. So I took a head unit out of an old Honda, and uh, specifically the uh, little. Um, uh, gear assembly that ejects the, the CD-ROM, CD-ROM, CD, and I made a, a, a really redneck latching relay. So I wanted, uh, I wanted this set up to where, like, when you, when you trigger it, it, uh, it does not be, you know, become undone by, you know, undoing the thing you just did to trigger it, right? So, in this case, opening the door. And how this works, basically, is this, um, this little mechanism starts winding up, and that uh, starts pulling on that, that trot line, which yanks a little piece of plastic out of the way between a clothespin that have two leads on it. That is the only thing separating uh, those leads from connecting and um, completing the circuit on this 32-volt uh, uh, array of 9 volts. So, and all of that runs down to the weasel on the wall. Of course. And spiders. How's that? So yeah, so I got, I got off that and, and uh, I thought, you know, the scope is a bit too broad. It's, it, it's tough for people to connect with that. So I started looking at specific uh, pieces of hardware. So like, what, what is our Arika washer-dryer combo, like, you know, the, for Cuba? So I, I started looking at Keurigs, and um, Keurigs are interesting to me for a couple reasons, right? So Keurigs, like, uh, they're in nearly one in every three homes, and that's a survey done last year. And um, uh, they, they um, no lack of critical issues for sure, right? These things break all the time for different reasons across generations. And uh, if you guys, guys like ever pull one apart or pull one open, uh, it's a lot of really cool stuff in there, right? So that's a nice recipe because you have a lot, of, a lot of these being thrown out and a lot of the, the components are still good, right? Minus one. And um, I wanted to know what you can do with that. So I wanted to find like, what's the potential of a curing? So I've gotten started on that and here we are. So uh, just a quick review of the common internals. So you'll have a display of some sort. This is usually connected to uh, like your user interface stuff. So maybe some buttons. Um, the more recent models, they upgrade a bit and they have uh, just a, a four conductor uh, a resistive touchscreen. So it kind of cleans things up. Uh, this is kind of the, the sort of the main board and 
this is sort of like a, the mullet of, of PCBs, right? It's like, like surface mount on the front, through hole in the back. Yeah. Although that's the front, I think, but it doesn't work as well for the joke. So uh, lots of little ribbon cables and wires here and there. Uh, some of these transformers, these have, like, some of them have discrete, you know, power uh, regulation boards and all that. Yeah, like, find nice little breakouts here and there. This is a, a momentary switch with a couple LEDs. Um, you'll find some of these um, nice um, reed switches here. Uh, these magnetic switches, these um, make sure that you got the lid closed and all that. You'll find some bottle caps in there for scale. Uh, anyone know what this is? So this is the guy responsible for the DRM and the, the 2.0 models? Right. Yeah, it's, uh, it just reads the levels of uh, RGB and, and A, I think. So yeah, you'll find one of these, at least. Uh, one, some kind of pump, uh, or some kind of motor assembly. Uh, uh, some of these are really nice, right? This one came out of a view, and uh, it's a nice stepper motor. It's got like built-in uh, speed control. Uh, it's got a brake on it, you could go reverse. It's got a Hall effect sensor built in, all this stuff. Uh, the newer ones, the 2.0s, they don't have that. They got a regular DC brushless, brushless motor, but uh, that's okay. You'll find some of these, uh, there's an air pump here and there. There's a water pump on the right. The old ones have these solenoids, which is nice. Uh, the new ones, they, they sort of did away with that. All of them will have a boiler of some sort. Here's one, right here. And um, a ton of uh, both flexible and rigid tubing, and as well as connectors, and stuff that you would put in a sock if you wanted to kill someone in prison. <laughs> and a whole lot of plastic, right? Different types of plastic, brittleness, thickness, you know, all that stuff, right? So, man, you could do a lot of stuff with that, right? Anyone's like, you know, wheels turning here? Mine certainly were. So, uh, just a quick disclaimer. Um, I don't represent Keurig in any way. I, I'm actually a customer. I use mine a couple times a day. I work at home. Uh, I say what I want. Uh, spaghetti. So, um, the first thing I wanted to do is, is look at, look at a, a thermal image of uh, Keurig working normally. And so, um, I did that. Basically, uh, who in here thinks that the Keurigs, when they boil, they boil under pressure when the water heats up? There's one guy. So, yeah, they, uh, they actually, they boil into the atmosphere, so I was disappointed about that. So basically, water heats up in the boiler, and then um, uh, a different pump rams air into that and forces it out over your coffee grounds into your cup, right? Excellent. So I wanted to figure out how to really disturb that process, so I started working on WARPAW, which is an acronym for the worst part of waking up. So I you know, started taking it apart, and, and keep in mind, guys, this is not like an exploit or anything, this is like just straight up sabotage, right? <laughs> like there's no, uh, there's no disclosure here. <laughs> yeah, so uh, you know, they got AC coming in, and um, that connects here to our main board, right? And then it eventually goes back out to these heating elements, but not before passing through uh, these two guys. And um, these are both uh, uh, heat related, so the bottom one is a, um, an SE fuse, it's got a little, um, uh, organic thermo uh, sensitive compound, and it's it's uh, crafted in such a way that if it gets you know reaches a certain temperature, melts down, spring disengages, and it, it you know separates your your, um, uh, your your circuit forever, right? The top one it just uh, either stays on or off until it reaches a certain temperature, and then it, it flip flops. Also, this guy it's a little pressure sensor, right? A little tube ring into the bottom. I imagine that probably has something to do with whether or not they're going to power, you know, the the uh, heating element on the boiler. Bless you. So. Um, if only there was a way to, uh, to bypass, you know, all of this logic. Oh, right, wire ties, so yeah. Um, now we've got a, you know, 120 volts AC going directly to the, the heating element, so that should be good, but we still have the, the issue of these three guys here, right? Oh, yeah, right, so uh, JB Weld, <laughs> that'll do it. Cool. So yeah, um, now we've got a boiler that's got water in it that is, uh, it should be sealed, right? And um, let's see what happens. Uh, all of our precious pressure. All right, so look at it thermally. It looks normal until it just like all of a sudden turns into Satan's butthole and the things just go sideways. So I actually left this on to see if like anything else would happen. I didn't figure it would, it just got hotter and hotter until like the, the whole house started smelling like Satan's butthole and then I cut it off because it was on fire pretty much, you know. It got super melty. 
It really smelled awful. Good grief. But yeah, no, I, I figured that, you know, our, our seals failed, but they did not, actually. Uh, it was a different result, and um, both of our, our uh, or all three of our seals were intact. What happened was um, it just got too hot, like the whole top just sort of like melted and slid to the side and just let all the pressure out, right? So that was kind of a bummer. I wanted it to explode and all that. But it's okay because science, right? That's a result. Now we know. So uh, we can sort of move on to, to new things. So um, the next thing I, I worked on, or actually this is a, during a conference, I um, uh, built a debug, and this is the uh, delicious uh, beverage dispensing badge of unmitigated Goran glory. And so basically, um, you've got a uh, solenoid and an air pump. Uh, uh, one button pumps air into the uh, container with a delicious beverage, and then um, when you uh, press the other button to uh, disengage the solenoid, that uh, has to go somewhere, so it comes out the little spout. Just like this. Ah. Uh, good job, fella. So when I travel with this, I like to leave a note just to be, just to be nice, I guess. Because it looks, he looks sketchy, man. <laughs> Seriously. Although I must say, every time I've traveled with this, my, my luggage has not been searched. So, or at least they're not leaving notes anymore. I don't know. They leave notes still? They leave notes, right? Oh, man. Anyway, so yeah. Um, it moves on to my, uh, my, my big bill here, and this is, this is Hedberg, and uh, that's not an acronym at all. Uh, so I, I, wanted, I wanted to build something that was um, you know, moderately complex. It had to, had to have some precision to really sort of work well, and um, I started looking at, at these uh, prosthetic hands, right? And these are cool because like, there's some really nice ones. This one's like, I think, 80 grand, something like that, something insane. But also, there's some really great work happening in like the 3D space, right? Like, so they could print these for 10 bucks, and they, they function, they're great. You could, like, as soon as you outgrow them, you just print another one. It's not a big deal, you know? Um, and it's all open source, and it's great, right? So I kind of wanted to see where, um, where I can get, you know, uh, just relative to both, you know, I guess the commercial product, right, which is crazy, and then sort of what uh, people are doing with, with uh, additive printing. So uh, I started making some junk prototypes just to sort of feel out um, what was possible, get, a, get a, an idea of how the materials work together, and so I, you know, I just started tinkering with, uh, with different mechanisms just to, I don't know, see what works and what didn't. So there's that. I started, uh, you know, dealing with these little finger guys. Because really, I think the, the digits were, were the thing I wanted to, to really kind of nail. That's sort of the, uh, the linchpin, right? So I tried a, different, a couple different designs, did a lot of research, saw what other people were doing. And um, I felt like, you know, based on all that knowledge, I, I could go ahead and start my build, right? So I started working on Hedberg. And a couple things to, uh, to note here, I used uh, one single Keurig, right? Uh, one single um, K350 or, or 300, kind of the same thing. And um, uh, only external materials in, in the, uh, the, the, head, the end product are adhesives. And I think that with a couple iterations of the design, you could probably uh, do away with a lot of that. I just used basic tools. You know, I, I didn't want to like, you know how you watch a, a, a video on YouTube or something and someone makes something cool and it's like, well, yeah, they've got a pristine shop with like every tool imaginable, right? Sort of like, I don't know. It's kind of cheating, right? So I just use a, a, a Dremel, basically, and a heat gun and some hand tools, files, stuff like that. Uh, no plans for this, just uh, sort of you know, making it up as I go along. And so um, at the end of the day, it, it was uh, 199 hours, 56 minutes, and, and 36 seconds of working time. So that's, that's uh, time at the bench um, you know, with my hands on materials doing things and manipulating stuff. And guess what? I recorded every second of that, and you're going to see it now. Settle in. You have to drum on it. Get it started. every second of this whole build. Settle in.
Hedberg. Thank you for working. So of course I made a case for it, and uh, of course it was uh, an issue at TSA. <laughs> So yeah, uh, let's talk about the features real quick. So it's got distributed grip pressure. I used uh, sort of a, a fulcrum here in the middle. So um, if uh, if there's more pressure on like one side of the hand or one side of the fingers than the other, it sort of, sort of like compensates with the other uh, other side. It has a an official gangster electronic speed controller on it. So there are no like five 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 timers or, or no like components necessary to build a traditional one. So uh, the issue was that the the regular motor it just moves too quickly, right? Your hand would just be like going crazy. There's no control. So um, had to improvise. So usually the way this is done is with uh, pulse width modulation. Um, so like think about an LED, it's either on or off, right? But you could dim them by turning them on and off really, really fast, and then like it gets more dim when you have it on less than you have it off. Make sense? So yeah, um, the way I did that uh, is it basically took uh, one of those motors and then took a piece of plastic in the middle and uh, mounted a magnet on one side of the thing that spins in the middle, and then uh, on the other side it just mounted a magnetic switch, right? So. Uh, you end up with something like this, and there's a little uh, screw there to adjust the um, uh, the amount of, of uh, exposure that that um, uh, magnetic switch actually gets with the magnet. So it, it actually increases or decreases the pressure. As you can see, it working here. Make sense? So every time that magnet swings around and it trips that uh, sensor, it puts uh, 12 volts to that that motor in your hand moves forward just a little bit more. So slowing it down, I thought about using friction, but that's probably a bad idea. So uh, you have to drop the voltage, try to voltage the divider. The, the resistors actually in, in the um, uh, Curie were, were not rated high enough, and these started smoking. That's bad. So um, eventually, um, my, I called my brother, and he was like, yeah, just, you know, diodes, they, they drop the voltage about 0.7 volts. And there are like nine of them in the Keurig, so I just chained a bunch of them together. So <laughs> that works just fine. It doesn't get too hot. You know, there are some room for improvements. Of course, I built it, so to me, it's perfect. Um, but yeah, you know, if you put a microcontroller and a few components in this thing, like, it would be ridiculous, right? So you could, you could start using that uh, color sensor. You could use that to get feedback on where the fingers are, potentially, uh, all sorts of things. You could um, actually, like, you know, implement analog input. You could, you know, control the, uh, you know, the speed and all that stuff. Um, you know, just using a microcontroller would be really simple. Um, of course, I, I didn't have that luxury here. Uh, but yeah, you can um, do all this cool stuff. So what's next for this, the Keurig stuff? Um, I want to look at like water filtration and purification. I want to look at cooking. I think that'd be fun. Uh, I think uh, there's some like interesting applications for gardening and maybe some hydroponics. Uh, I would like to build an aquarium because that'd be funny. Um, Meta, what about, what about like building something that would help you build other stuff? Okay. Uh, but one thing that I, I've actually started on and got, got some headway going here are uh, firearms. So I might be the first person to actually shoot a Keurig. Uh, so where do we go from here? Uh, real quick, because we're, we're like short on time. Guys, the stuff surrounding us all the time has like huge amounts of potential. Like, huge. Like everybody, everybody. Long pants, long pants, right? Humongous. And um, if, the, if the thing that like gives you mediocre coffee every day could, can actually help someone pick something up who normally couldn't, like, like the, that, that represents a huge gap in, in like what we're using it for and what, what the actual, actual potential this thing is, right? So, um, frequent MacGyvering, it, 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 lets you, it lets your brain naturally find more uh, interesting and, and clever solutions to everyday problems. It's just a good like, mental exercise. Uh, also, if you're stubborn enough, everything is sandpaper. <clears throat> and winter is coming. So, for this project, it was, it was almost two hour, 200 hours long. And like, the first part was great, because I got fingers going. And I was like, yeah, fingers. And I'm like, ah, oh, crap. And I got to like, actually make, make this work consistently and like, you know, like drudge through the, the slow and tedious parts and you know fail and try things again and all that stuff. So that was um that was tough and it's it's good to it's good to know that going in and like get mentally prepared for it just so you could actually finish finish the project, right? Uh big one is man, take everything apart. This is a huge skill. I don't care if it's yours or not. I'm not the police. But dude, like like if you get a, enough experience with this thing, right? Taking something apart will eventually become like having a conversation with the engineer who built it, which is pretty cool because like as I'm taking stuff apart, I'm like, why is this here? Like, oh, this is, this is pressure fit. I don't have to use any screws here. That's, that's great. So yeah, I want to thank a few awesome people real quick. Uh, my mom, first and foremost, like, the, the time last video, I knew I wanted Claire de Lune in it because that's one of my favorite like Vegas songs I, for a lot of reasons. And um, 
it's actually in the public domain. All the recordings uh, were, were kind of pricey. Um, my mom's a, 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 a pianist, um, and so I, my wife had the idea. I was like, call your mom. I was like, eh, yeah. Oh, okay. And she like ran off in a storm and recorded that for me. And uh, that will be available in the public domain. Uh, if you guys want to download it, uh, I'll put a link in my Twitter eventually. Um, yeah, thanks, Mom. Uh, Dan Teller, uh, right here, uh, he, he let me borrow his uh, thermal cam for like, like months. And, uh, and last night I was like, you know, man, I, I need some Vegas footage here. And like, it was like 9 o'clock. I was like, Dan, do you you want to shoot some stuff, and like a couple drinks later, at like 2 a.m., we had like some freaking amazing footage. So thanks for that, Dan. Uh, my brother Taylor, he would uh, be available on the phone for like electronics questions. He's a, an EE and all that stuff. And most of all, you guys, right? So I'm talking to you guys, and uh, and you guys absolutely blow me away with the stuff you're working on, and like in the struggles that you're going through with it. And I, it occurs to me that like a lot of you, you're probably like carrying the flag, you know, all by yourself on a lot of the stuff. And a lot of the stuff's like, oh, a lot of your projects are really important, even like your side projects. So I just want to encourage you guys to like, like, like keep your head up with that. Like, even if the, the number of people supporting you is zero, like, that's all right, you know? Come to these things and find people who, who get you and help you, you know, be you and, and like, get your, get your awesome projects done. So guys, thanks so much. Go build some stuff. Awesome.